BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. In the aftermath of a bitter and divisive election, Washington, unsurprisingly, feels tense. Some shops and offices have boarded up their doors and windows, concerned that the anger of the election might spill over into unrest. Local residents out jogging or shopping pass groups of Trump supporters in their Make America Great Again hats. The thick veneer of American interpersonal politeness conceals some of the tensions swirling around the Capitol. I've come to Washington to talk to Barack Obama, 44th President of the United States, serving from 2009 to 2017. Obama came to power in the midst of the financial crisis of a decade ago. His former vice president, Joe Biden, now the president-elect, is preparing to take office and face twin crises of his own. A pandemic that seems to be spiralling out of control and in America deeply and dangerously divided. President Obama looks back at his first term in office in his new memoir, A Promised Land. I began by asking him about a movement that started under his presidency and, in 2020, became a global phenomenon. Black Lives Matter. Mr. President. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Can I ask you about the timing of A Promised Land? You were writing it, as the preface says, you were putting the final touches to it in August right. during the summer, during the summer of Black Lives Matter, an right. enormous explosion of debate and discussion and protest and what you called righteous anger that's been compared to the civil rights movement. How did those events and that atmosphere, how did that impact on your views of where America stands right now in this long journey in its relationship with race and racism? Well, uh, David, as you know, uh, this is the first of what I intend to have uh, as two volumes. So my discussion of some of the events that happened during my presidency, Trayvon Martin, Ferguson uh, will be in the second volume. But obviously a running thread through not just this book, but also my presidency was uh, the question of race. That's been one of the central fault lines uh, in American history, uh, our original sin. And I think as I was watching the events unfold this summer, both the, the death of, of George Floyd, the murder of George Floyd, uh, but also the response. Uh, I, it was a mixture of despair and optimism. Uh, despair that the chronic lingering uh, role of race and bias in our criminal justice system uh, continues in such a blatant form. Enormous optimism that you saw an outpouring of protest, activism, and interest that far exceeded anything we had seen previously uh, and was peaceful, was thoughtful, was well-organized, uh, and was multiracial. Uh, I mean, traditionally, after Ferguson, after Trayvon Martin, you know, there was still, I think, resistance on the part of large portions of the white community in America uh, to push back against the notion that this was more than just one incident or a case of bad apples. Uh, what you saw this summer was uh, some communities that had a very negligible black population, uh, folks going out there and saying black lives matter and embracing uh, the, the notion that real change has to come. Uh, and, and that, I think, is in some ways uh, consistent with the themes of this book, which you know, I, I call it a promised land because you know, in biblical terms, you know, Moses doesn't get there. You know, you're wandering for 40 years. Uh, it's full of uh, trials and tribulations and travails. But the, the notion that uh, if we are persistent and hopeful, we can make things better. Uh, if not for ourselves, then certainly for future generations, uh, I think is what propelled me into politics, and it's what I saw on display this summer. And you hold true to that belief in what you call 
the possibility of America. And you're yet candid about the contradictions of America, this nation conceived in liberty, but by men who were themselves, in many cases, the owners of enslaved Africans. How do you balance your, your belief in the possibility of America with your candid assessment of the nation's flaws? As I, as I discuss in my uh, preface, I, I think it's useful to hold two ideas in your head at the same time, which is that um, America is full of flaws and contradictions, and yet, despite the cruelties, despite the, the obvious uh, violations of our professed ideals, slavery, Jim Crow, the treatment of Native Americans, uh, the internment of Japanese during World War II, so forth. Um, this remains an experiment that matters not just for Americans but for the world. You don't have an example in, in history of a great power whose population is made up of people who come from everywhere and are functioning as a democracy and are trying to figure out, can we live together peacefully? Uh, can we bind ourselves to a common creed, even if we don't look alike, don't have the same last names, don't necessarily worship in the same way? Um, and, you know, what is the source of optimism is you see a trajectory in which American democracy becomes more and more inclusive starting with the abolitionists and the suffragettes and the union movement and later uh, in our history uh, the LGBTQ movement at systematically saying you know what when we describe we the people it's not just a handful of folks it's not just property owners it's not just white males it's it's all of us uh, we have a seat at the table and there is a powerful um, and beautiful story to tell in in that progression but as i point out and as i think uh, our recent history indicates uh, that history doesn't move in a straight line it zigzags and can go backwards uh, you know if you were uh, a African-American right after uh, the Civil War during Reconstruction, you might feel pretty optimistic. Fifteen years later, you'd feel very pessimistic because there was a massive retrenchment. Um, and that, I think, is the thing that always makes me cautiously optimistic as opposed to Pollyannish about uh, America and, and, for that matter, about the world. Uh, because just as uh, Great Britain is dealing with these issues, the European continent is dealing with these issues, far-flung places like Myanmar are dealing with these issues. Uh, you know, if you have people who are different, uh, are we able to recognize their humanity? Are we able to embrace their rights and their voice uh, in uh, determining the course uh, and direction of our societies. And, and with the world shrinking, that, that task becomes more urgent than ever. The, the book, including its title, is uh, loaded with symbolism, symbolism from the Bible, from the words of Martin Luther King, from Abraham Lincoln. You can feel the weight of American history and lots of the language that you use. And that symbolism was always there as part of your, your, your journey. You began your journey to the White House in 2007, announcing your candidacy, um, as you remind us in the book, at the old state capitol building in Springfield, Illinois, where Abraham Lincoln gave his famous uh, A House Divided speech. In 2020, is America once again a house divided? We are very divided right now, um, more than, cer certainly more than we were when I first ran for office in 2007 and, and won the presidency in 2008, uh, even more divided than when I ran for re-election in 2012, and more divided than we were uh, four years ago uh, when uh, Donald Trump first won the presidency. And some of that is attributable to uh, 
our current president, who actively fanned division because he felt it was good for his politics. Um, but it preceded him, uh, and it will outlast him. And I discuss in the book some of the trends that have created that kind of division. Um, uh, some of it has to do with uh, broad socioeconomic factors, uh, growing inequality, uh, the, the growing division between rural and urban America, which is paralleled in uh, you know, the UK and, and uh, around the world, uh, reactions to globalization and technology and uh, people feeling as if they're losing a, a grip on the ladder uh, of economic advancement and, and so react uh, and can be persuaded that it's this group's fault or that group's fault, it's immigrants' fault, it's folks who are taking advantage of the system. So, so some of that was there. It has been greatly magnified by the course of media. Here in the United States, you, you start with older media forms like Fox News and talk radio hosts like Rush Limbaugh that, uh, uh, whose business model is premised on fanning a certain kind of anger, resentment, a certain story about uh, you know, people who are not like us are taking advantage of us um, and we have to fight back. That has been turbocharged by social media. Uh, and you know, I think the, the debate that's been taking place here about you know, the kinds of uh, crazy conspiracy theories and what some have called truth decay, right, where facts don't matter, you know, everything uh, is fair game, everything goes. That has contributed enormously uh, to these divisions. And it's, it's going to take more than one election to uh, reverse those trends. Uh, it's going to require work uh, at a local level as well as national level. It's going to require not just political work but cultural work uh, to get people to listen to each other, think more critically uh, in evaluating information. I think at some point it's going to require a, a combination of, of regulation and standards within industries uh, to get us back to the point where we at, at least recognize a common set of facts before we start arguing about what we should do about those facts. Um, You've said in the past that Americans at the moment can't recognize each other. We, we, look, if, if, um, if you are somebody who exclusively watches you know, uh, right-wing media, I am unrecognizable <laughs> as, a, as a figure because what I, what's portrayed of me is just a caricature. It, it, it doesn't compute with what I believe, what I say, et cetera. But you know, there are millions of people who subscribe to the notion that Joe Biden is a socialist, uh, you know, who subscribe to the notion that uh, Hillary Clinton was part of a uh, evil cabal that uh, was involved in pedophile rings. I, you know, that kinds of stuff is constantly circulating. What's been interesting, obviously, and, and sad during this election is that um, that kind of lack of fidelity to the truth has consequences when it's being promoted by uh, the most powerful uh, elected official in the country. Um, and the pandemic is a classic example of uh, reality biting back uh, if you ignore it for too long. Um, obviously, the same would apply in a more slow rolling but ultimately perhaps even more damaging way with climate change. Uh, and it began in some ways, your, your presidency was the experiment for the, these ideas with birtherism, again involving Donald Trump. It was your, your person to an extent, that was the first target for this wandering from the truth? You know, I, I won't say that I was the first target, but I think that 
what you started seeing with Sarah Palin, uh, who John McCain selected as his running mate and sort of liked to swim in these waters, uh, uh, and then with the Tea Party, its emergence, uh, birtherism, which Donald Trump promoted, um, what you started seeing was a systematic effort to not just demonize me, paint me as the other, but I think more profoundly uh, the realization that the old rules about paying a price for being caught lying <laughs> or making stuff up no longer applied, that you could uh, because of the multiplicity of media outlets out there, you could just put out whatever you wanted. Uh, and even if conventional mainstream media fact-checked you and said you were wrong and so forth, uh, you know, uh, falsehoods had already you know, circled the globe by the time truth you know, got out of the gates. And, uh, and so that breakdown in uh, some of our conventions around public discourse began to change. And, and you know, we notice it, people I think noticed it more with things like birtherism. But um, it actually applied in, in less uh, obvious ways, for example, during the debate around health care, uh, you know, when uh, the Republican Party starts saying that uh, the health care bill we had proposed, um, which was actually modeled on a bipartisan uh, approach championed by Mitt Romney when he was the governor of Massachusetts, a Republican, along with Ted Kennedy, a Democrat, that still involved private insurance, you started getting these crazy stories about, well, this is going to um, legalize euthanasia, and they're going to kill your grandma, and this is going to provide uh, free health care to uh, undocumented workers, illegal immigrants, and so on and so forth. Stuff that was clearly not true, and, and the people who were saying fringes. it understood that it wasn't true. But, you know, if you repeated it uh, often enough, uh, began to get traction uh, uh, within uh, certain segments of the American people. And these ideas used to be on the fringes, and then they moved very much to the center yes. of both Republican uh, policy and right. politicking. Yes. That makes bipartisanship, which is one of the, the lubricants that makes this system work in theory, right. very difficult. Is bipartisanship possible today? It is very challenging. Um, if, and, and, and look, I, I, I mentioned in the book, you can't romanticize entirely the bipartisanship that existed uh, right after World War II and, let's say, lasted through Ronald Reagan's presidency, maybe George H.W. Bush's presidency. Um, it had already started breaking down with Bill Clinton. A, a, a lot of the old bipartisanship was premised on um, you had s Southern Democrats who were quite conservative. You had liberal Republicans from northeastern states. Uh, th there wasn't uh, a, a sharp uh, ideological slant to each party. And uh, what happens in America is often called uh, the, the great sort, right? Uh, where, uh, you know, those uh, Dixiecrats, Southern Democrats, uh, uh, abandon the Democratic Party right after Lyndon Johnson signs the Civil Rights Act and, and African Americans become more empowered politically. Um, and conversely, a lot of Republicans who are pro-civil rights or pro-environment, they get driven out of their party. Uh, and so it makes it much more difficult to find the uh, the outliers, the iconoclasts, the, those who are willing to break party ranks. Because we don't have a parliamentary system in this country, it's always relied to some degree on the ability to work across the aisle. This isn't a situation where you win the election and then the prime minister and his party or her party are able to simply implement their agenda until they get booted out. Um, 
And as I mentioned, there's a particular feature in the American system, uh, the filibuster in the Senate, which essentially is a supermajority requirement that was very rarely used. It's sort of an accident of history, but now has become a permanent feature in how Congress operates, which makes it very easy for a minority government to block anything. And that gridlock, uh, which you know, uh, has prevailed for now 20, 30 years in many ways, that I was able to overcome briefly when I had such a big majority in those first two years that allowed me to pass the health care legislation and uh, some other measures. Um, you know, it's going to be very rare where either party in America has that big a, a majority to get things done. And what I worry about is on everything from a pandemic to a major economic crisis to climate change, it's hard for this big, creaky system to move quickly enough to respond to the very real needs of the American people. Um, and I, I think that there are going to be s some structural reforms that have to happen. P because part of the cynicism people feel about government is if, if government's gridlocked, that's good for people who want to protect the status quo. Um, you know, I, I experienced this during my presidency. Things I wanted to get done that I couldn't get done because of these problematic features in the government uh, and, and how it functions would dishearten and discourage my base, um, which then leads them not to vote, which then leads me to then lose more seats during a midterm election, which then makes it even harder to get things done. And, and you start getting into that vicious loop. Um, Can I ask you about, and part of what's happening in America that you draw a lot of hope from. You, you write at the beginning of the book about the attitudes of the young, of your, of your daughter's generation, yeah. and especially when it comes to issues of race and equality, that those attitudes are profoundly different to yeah. their parents and their grandparents' generation. Is, is America, is perhaps the world, at a great inflection moment between generations with very different views of the world? They are, uh, and and it's not just around race. It's around gender. It's around sexual orientation. I, you know, my my daughters, and their peers, cannot conceive of treating somebody uh, differently because they're gay or bisexual or, or transgender. Um, and I'm not saying that they are representative of all young people, but when you look at surveys, this is not just anecdotal, when you look at uh, surveys, public opinion, among folks under 30, um, you know, they, be they believe, as I say in the book, they believe what we taught them and their teachers taught them, even if we didn't believe it ourselves. Um, they've internalized this notion that of course, these surface differences can't be the determinants of who gets a job or you know, whether or not a, a police officer uh, treats them fairly uh, on a routine traffic stop. And, and that does give me great hope. And they're idealistic I, you know, when you look at this, this uh, young, younger generation. And I know it's not just America because both as president, when I would do town halls with young people around the world, um, and now with the Obama Foundation that's focused on developing this next generation of leadership, it doesn't matter whether I'm in uh, Johannesburg or Buenos Aires or uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, you talk to these young people, they share that common attitude. They are more sophisticated. They've, the, the, the collision of cultures is something they are comfortable with. They are used to music and food and movies and books and you know uh, dance moves from every place and it's a polygot world and that that's something comfortable to them and the folks who resist are oh, us old folks who want to fasten our, our ourselves to uh, our old attitudes and uh, and and I think that the, the question then becomes how do we create institutions that reflect this new spirit, but also recognize that um, a lot of the ways that we constrained capitalism, created inequality, uh, or created more uh, equality, uh, 
uh, provided uh, social safety nets. Those have been organized through our national governments, and globalization and technology have torn a lot of those apart, and they have to be rebuilt. Um, so the spirit that is prompting nationalism and nativism and xenophobia in some cases, it's not that suddenly people are, are meaner or automatically uh, uh, looking to harm others. I think they feel uncertain. Uh, unmoored, and the the liberal democratic uh, post Cold War structures, both in Europe and the United States, had been very good for cosmopolitan elites. Hadn't been so good for folks who are in more rural communities, working class, etc. And frankly. Uh, we have to do a better job in creating new institutions that allow us to be inclusive, but also responsive uh, to people's day-to-day -day lives. There are those who have said that the sight of a black president, the sight of an African-American first family, while certainly an historic achievement for America, may also have been the event that revealed the depths of America's historic problem with race. What they say, in short, is that your presidency, not for what you did, but for, for who you are, in the end, made these situations, the race relations issue, worse. How do you respond to that line of argument? I, you know, uh, that doesn't make much sense, um, the idea that it made it worse. I do think that it exposed some fault lines in our culture that we have to work through, but uh, the fact that you saw all those protests this summer indicate the degree to which uh, we have the capacity to work them through. Um, it, you know, I, I was never of the view that somehow my election signified a post-racial America. What I was of the view and still am, is that the majority of Americans have very different attitudes than their parents and their grandparents did. And that's indisputable. By the way, 2008 wasn't an accident. I then got reelected in 2012 and left office in 2016 in a pretty good position if there weren't term limits uh, and had not Michelle put a kibosh on things, you know, uh, even without the Constitution. Um, you know, where I, I certainly uh, had the majority of the American people still approving of, of the job I was doing. So, so that indicates a change in attitudes. It also allowed for eight years children growing up, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, to learn to take for granted that a black person could occupy the highest office in the land. And they internalize that. Um, and now another generation will be able to take for granted the idea that a woman of that, Indian and Jamaican and heritage then, yeah, exactly. can be vice president. That's exactly right. right? And, and, and that's how progress gets made. But along the way, there's going to be pushback. There's going to be resistance. And I, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that Donald Trump's election was in some ways uh, in part fueled by anxieties around these changes that are taking place. He was very explicit about it, right? Make America great again, <laughs> right? So there was this, there's this interim period when uh, things aren't, aren't great. Um, and I can't change or apologize for those reactions and that backlash. That's the nature of progress. But what I can say for certain is, is that uh, after eight years I haven't been president, uh, the country was better off than when I started, and young people, many of whom entered into government, um, uh, did outstanding work, got amazing experience, and felt as if, you know what, government's not separate from me, it's something that I have agency over and, and uh, can use and be a part of. Uh, and uh, and and that will have ripple effects 
uh, that go beyond the particular challenges that we're facing right now and uh, makes me, again, cautiously optimistic as long as we're all uh, vigilant. And, and that's part of what the uh, a promised land is about, w wanting young people to cultivate that cautious optimism, that, that the world can change, but you, uh, you have to be a part of that change. Mr. President, thank you very much for your time. I look forward to volume two. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. With the interview at an end, President Obama and his team headed off to their next appointment. What he left behind was his unshakable sense of optimism, that belief in the promise of America, even in the aftermath of an election and a transition like no other. And you'll be able to hear President Obama reading an abridged version of A Promised Land on BBC Radio 4 in December. You can subscribe to that here on BBC Sounds.